Hello and welcome to the Beyond Organic Wine podcast. Oh, I hope you like that as much as I do. This is Adam Huss coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Thank you so much for listening. First, I also want to say a big thank you to those of you who subscribe via our Patreon channel. I'm going to be releasing some more content directly onto Patreon as a further thank you and benefit to you. I'll let you know about that. You continue to inspire and humble me and make this podcast possible. The follow-up to that is that I'm actually finding it difficult financially to prioritize the time it takes to publish a weekly episode. The Beyond Organic Wine podcast has grown to be in the top 10% of all podcasts. That is huge. But I'm also experiencing the growing pains of guiding the success while doing all the work myself. It can easily take 20 hours to produce a single episode when I account for the time I spend researching, coordinating, recording, editing, and producing and publicizing. It's like being a journalist without getting paid. I've already slowed my production of episodes to allow time for more financially fruitful pursuits, but also the reality of the significant time cost of each episode has forced me to consider how I might use that 20 hours to actually get paid to be a journalist. For example, I'm really excited to do an episode about the term foxy, the F word, as it has been used to describe native and hybrid grapes and wine. However, when I consider the time to research, coordinate with various people and write, record, and edit, that will be involved in producing the story, I'm also now immediately considering that I might better spend that time pitching that as a story to a media outlet that would pay me to write it for them. So to bridge the financial gap between the current generosity of you amazing Patreon subscribers and the significant amount of time that I still don't get paid to spend producing content, I'm looking for sponsors for individual episodes or series of episodes. You may want to sponsor an episode because there's a topic you think I should cover that you'd really like to spread the word about, or you may just want to sponsor an episode in a more traditional marketing way so that I can spend a couple minutes telling listeners about the cool stuff that you're doing with wine. For whatever reason, if you want to sponsor an episode or multiple episodes, please email me at connect at organicwinepodcast.com. And if you'd like to support this podcast via Patreon, that link is in the show notes. Thank you all so much for your support. I'm spending this time to ask for your help because of how much it means to me to be able to bring these stories and people and questions to you. And now my guest for this episode is Nan McCary. She's no exception to the exceptional people I've been able to bring to you on this podcast. Nan is an ethnobotanist by passion and trade. And she has a focus on the native grapes of North America over the last few years. What we might call native grapes, Nan refers to as crop wild relatives. She talks about the importance of preserving the biodiverse gene pool contained in these crop wild relatives and the work she has helped with to catalog and inventory these North American vines. One of the most famous incidents demonstrating the importance of biodiversity contained within crop wild relatives is, of course, the rescue of the entire wine industry from phylloxera. The term crop wild relatives refers to the genetic ancestors of our current domesticated wine crops and other crops. But by the time Nan gets done explaining the process of domestication from an evolutionary perspective, you may begin to think of the term in a different way. You may begin to step away from your human-centric perspective and see yourself as a relative of the grapevines that you tend. This idea was introduced to me, actually, on a podcast called The Land You're On, which I highly recommend. It's a podcast that interviews members of the Onondaga and other nations of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, the oldest currently functioning democracy on Earth and the inspiration for our current society here in the U.S. and other Western democracies. If you've heard of the Three Sisters in gardening and farming, corn, beans, and squash, this came from the people of the Haudenosaunee. If you like strawberries, you can thank these folks for those as well. And in one of the episodes on The Land You're On, about an incredible living library of seeds, an Onondaga seed keeper talks about how her culture sees food as a relative The crops collaborate with the people who farm them to help each other survive, have sovereignty, and provide for seven generations to come. If you're going to listen to just one episode from this podcast, let it be this one. I never would have thought that a seed bank could make me cry, but wow. (laughs) And I began to think about how I could see wine as a relative. What would it mean? How would I work differently with the vines? How would I work with fermentations if I took this perspective? 
Nan and I talk about a presentation she created, which is one of the most unique and impactful combinations of science and psychology that I've seen. Nan sees wine, grapevines, and really everything from an evolutionary standpoint. And like many of you and myself, she cares deeply about what humans are doing to the environment. Because of this, she partnered with a local organization dedicated to mindfulness, imaginebeingwell.org, to explain the cosmic evolution story and how this helps to deal with eco-anxiety. I've definitely experienced eco-anxiety, and I found Nan's presentation to be one of the most helpful things I've ever seen, which actually speaks to me from a scientific perspective that I found refreshing and more compelling than many other things. We only touch on a small part of her presentation here, but Nan has generously allowed me to post the entire presentation on her episode page at beyondorganicwine.com. So if you ever experience eco-anxiety, I highly recommend checking it out. Also at beyondorganicwine.com, you'll find a link to Nan's talk about the importance of native grapes. And you can learn more about Nan and her other projects at ethnobot.org and on Instagram at successionalforest. Enjoy. Nan, welcome. Thanks for uh, talking and having this conversation. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited to be here, Adam. Well, could you introduce yourself and, you know, talk a little bit about your background and areas of expertise and uh, some of some of the things that, you know, brought you here, brought, brought us together. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, I, I have actually had sort of multiple careers. Um, my passion in life is uh, is as an ethnobotanist, a person who uh, is interested in um, humans interacting with plants. Um, specifically in my case in agriculture. Um, and um, that is actually what brought me to you, uh, to listening to your podcast a few years ago as I was working on a project that uh, we'll talk about today, uh, which was on the grapes, the crop wild relatives of the grapes, which we, uh, we'll get to. Mm -hmm. Um and then I, I do have some other, I, I'm not always paid for that work. Um, it's, it is, as I said, it's my passion. And um, yeah, I also I'm not always do, paid for making wine either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm very fortunate to, to get to do that. Um, for a long time, I was at home raising my kids, um, did a lot of environmental education. Um, then I was teaching adults in a uh, wonderful um class I was facilitating called Landscape for Life, which uh, helped homeowners learn how to um, do their gardening and landscaping more sustainably. Um, kind of got into that because there's a big native plant movement here. I live in uh, outside of Leesburg, Virginia, which is not far from Washington, D.C. And um, I thought the native, I was drawn into the native plant movement as a botany enthusiast. Um, but I always felt that we weren't talking about the soil and the water at the beginning of that movement. And um, that's what I was excited about with Landscape for Life. And then I've also tried to bring those Landscape for Life principles to my own yard. We happen to have three acres that were on. When we moved here, it was mostly lawn. So I'm also part of that kind of transition your lawn movement. Mm, um, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, well, um, so, yeah, and I, I originally studied geography and got a master's degree in geography at the University of Texas. And uh, and the reason I went there is there were other people interested in this kind of thing. Uh, plant domestication was the thing that I was most interested in. Oh, me too. And I especially the history of that. And we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. And can you just for me as well as for anybody who's unfamiliar with what, what do you what does it mean when you say crop wild relatives? So crop wild relatives are simply crops that are relate. I mean, sorry, uh, wild plants or weeds that are related to our crop plants, and all crop plants have them. Sometimes they might be the progenitors of the crops, and people may be familiar with this idea. Um, there's a rather well-known progenitor of corn or maize, by, for example, called Teosinte, um, which still grows in Mexico and in Highland Guatemala. Um, th that is the progenitor and it's a crop wild relative. Um, but 
for many of our crops, maybe the progenitor is no longer with us and there can be any number of um, wild plants and weedy plants that are related to the crop, usually the same, um, usually different species in the same genus, but sometimes even uh, more distantly related. And the key is that they have the gen genetic diversity that's lacking in our crop plants. Um, breeders have really always relied upon these, and um, it's really important to conserve these wild plants. It's, it's just a really unappreciated uh, aspect of, of course, the loss of biodiversity in general, um, which we're all familiar with. And uh, this is kind of one more little reason to keep many of these plants um, in both living in the wild, um, in their place. We call that in situ and then also conserving them in gene banks and seed banks um, for long-term use because that's where the genetic diversity is and that's um, what's needed for our, our crops to, to keep them going. Um, and even with climate change, of course, even more so now. Right. And how did that lead you to grapes or what was the, I mean, I, I can, I, how does that, how did that apply in your life to grapes and what, what is so, that? So, okay. Doing? So I really wanted to work on crop wild relatives and um, hadn't really been able to get back into that. And uh, I actually started volunteering with a woman working at Nature Serve, which um, is a, an organization that keeps track of the conservation status of organisms in North America. And she had a passion for doing this. And I said, I'll volunteer for you. And she said, well, you know, there is this little project on the grapes that I've, we've been talking about doing. So that actually developed into a contract uh, with them to work on this. So I fell into the grapes completely because that was the crop wild relative that um, she thought it would be really fun to start this pilot program with. And the program was putting together a workshop on the native grapes of North America. Mm -hmm. um, and then down the road, we ended up getting funding from the U.S. Botanic Garden and USDA. So what can you tell us about the native grapes of North America? From, from okay. So, um, yeah, so I just want to clarify in case people aren't familiar with this concept. Um, now, I also, I say vitus. So I'm going to Great. say Vitus vinifera. Do, do you find that you... Some people say Vitus. Some people say Vitus. Um, the group of scientists that I work with says Vitus. So if that sounds odd to anybody, that's that's why. So, I've always assumed I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so whatever. Um, I'll take whatever you say. <laughs> okay. So Vitus vinifera um, is the wine, the European wine grape. Um, and it's the grape that we're probably you know, um, you're probably drinking wine from Vitus vinifera pretty much over most of the world. It's what we call the domesticated grape. And that means it's come under human tending uh, and cultivation to the point that it is genetically different from its ancestor. I um, want to throw in an interesting thing. It just came out in the spring of this year. They uh, discovered there were two domestications of Vitus yeah. vinifera. Yeah, one right. in Georgia and one in the Mediterranean. One in like, so, the, like the Syria, Lebanon, Israel area, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Right. Yep. Yes, um, thank you. Um, so so that's Vitus vinifera. And so the Vitus genus um, has about, it depends on who you talk to, 60 or 70 species worldwide. Many of those are in Asia. There's about, it's there's considered to be about 25 or so um, species and varieties of vitus in North America. Um, and we were looking at the ones in the U.S. and Canada. There's also some uh, vitus species in Mexico um, and some other places. But um, so we were looking at the, let's say, 25 or so species and varieties that are native to the U.S. and Canada. So like and... The really fascinating thing, um, some of your guests, um, uh, viewers may know this, but um, they, uh, some of them have very important germplasm um, that's needed by breeders. And the cool thing about grapes, of course, is that um, 
it's the the first example of the use of crop wild relatives to save a crop. And again, probably the people listening to this are fairly familiar with this, with the phylloxera crisis in the Mm -hmm. um, late 19th century or second half of the 19th century in Europe and how the um, industry was almost wiped out um, by phylloxera. So the interesting thing is, of course, um, our rootstock saved the industry. Um, The phylloxera had originally come from the new world also. So we kind of right, caused right. the problem and solved the problem. Um, right. And um, and I think the reason that it was happening was they had already been bringing over vines to, for earlier um, outbreaks of maybe downy and powdery mildew. And then, you know, botanists and explorers, they just love carrying plants around the world. And, and when, when the age of exploration was happening, there was always just a lot of exchange of materials and it's fun to see what will grow. And anyway, phylloxera ended up in Europe and here um, in North America, it phylloxera infects the vines, um, but it just gets into the leaf and makes these little galls, which probably many, probably people are very familiar with. And then of course um, on Vitus vinifera, it gets into the roots and um, destroys the root. So um, after looking at, many different sorts of solutions. Eventually some uh, rootstock was bred between Vitus riparia and Vitus rupestris. And that was used um, as the basis for rootstock for the European wine grape. Um, And then Vitus berlandieri was brought in as a third because of um, the limestone soils in Europe and Vitus berlandieri grows um, on the line, um, the Edwards Plateau of Texas, so it is, uh, uh, it's adapted to that. Got it. This is really fascinating to me for many, many reasons. But it, it sounds, I mean, just to step back again, I mean, the genetic potential in North American grapes is what, like forty percent of plus of the total like species <laughs> available in uh, you know Vita species on the planet are in North America. Yes, um, right. Uh-huh. It, it seems like a huge, I, I always think about the fact that, you know, so we, you know, we have this Vitus vinifera vine that has been cultivated for 8,000 years plus, and out of it, we have this pantheon of, I mean, thousands upon thousands of varieties within that species that mm-hmm. have been cultivated and, you know, all different shapes and sizes and flavors and colors. Um, and we have, we've, just begun to tap into you know in the last 200 years the the north american species and like think of the potential that's there like that's what i always think about is like give Mm -hmm. us a little time especially now that we can accelerate some of this um you know genetic uh splicing as well as breeding you know Mm -hmm. much more sophisticated tools than our ancestors did at the moment at this moment and I mean, give us a thousand years and where would we be if we actually allowed the focus and attention and resources to be given to these, uh, you know, native species here. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's just, yeah, it's really fascinating to me to think about that. Do you, how, like, what are the fascinating and important things about the domestication of this crop or any crop? you know, the crops in general that, that have fascinated you and sort of surprised you as you've dug into domestication? Well, um, the, the biggest thing is that we should get away from thinking about um, humans making a decision to move into farming, for example, or to domesticate a crop. Um, mm-hmm. Archaeologists and um, other scientists are telling us that this is really sort of a symbiotic relationship. It's it's more like the pollinators, you know, the bees and the uh, flowers. Hmm. It's yeah. Um, and humans create disturbed environments everywhere we go. Um, and in these disturbed environments, you get weeds, and you get uh, and some of them eventually became crops. Um, and you also get um, other plants taking advantage of that, and some of them became our crops. And it's thought that. Um, the very actions that we were doing as we were hunting and gathering, and perhaps we would be using, I think that actually grapes are one of the ones that um, there's evidence of long, long sort of tending and cultivation before the genetic changeover in the plant 
to a separate domesticated crop. So it's a very, gra- it, well, it's not always a gradual process, but it's a, um, it's a symbiotic process of, you know, it's often said the plant is, could be thought of as the actor here as, you know, finding, yeah. finding niches where it can really, um, uh, reproduce and, mm-hmm. um, and populate the area because it's appealing to the human, you know, just the way the flower is appealing to the bee. Um, so it's, I think it's, for me, it's fascinating to get away uh, from the idea of um, humans as the agents. And I mm. wonder sometimes about history in general and how much, mm. how much stuff happens rather than us sitting about to make things happen. Mm. Um, and that's definitely the case. It's, 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 it's important to think of it as just another way of natural selection occurring with the humans doing the selection and people, some people won't, will call that artificial selection because the humans are doing the selection. Um, I think of it as a part of natural selection because, you know, you have animals that um, other animals besides humans who will be selecting, you know, certain riper berries or, or, or in, in other ways, every, everything you do changes the genetic makeup of that population of, of plants. Yeah. And now here's, here's a, I, I mean, first of all, I love that insight. I, I often think about like my, you know, we, we have a yard full of flowers and things like that. And hummingbirds live all around our, our yard here. And when you see them dip into a flower and it's like one of the trumpet flowers and you're just mm-hmm. like, there is which created which, like you yeah, know, which right. came first, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, there is no there isn't two separate beings. Like they came right. together. They are together. They could not exist without each other. And right. they, it's like, you have to start thinking them as humming flowers rather than a flower. Yeah. And a humming, <laughs> right. You know? Um, and I think of that, like with the bison on a larger scale, you know, like that's a, you know, in the, in the great plains, like it's mm-hmm. an ecosystem, these two egos, I mean, like the, the, the giant flo- fauna and the flora of that ecosystem evolved together and, you know, created each other and yeah. relied on each other. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, so, and then, yeah, it's, I love thinking about that with grapes too, that it's like the grapes are sort of, I mean, I've written actually a thing about how, you know, the grapes are actually the actors where we're, <laughs> we yes. have been lured into just, you know, creating these massive global systems to spread their juice around the planet, you know, well, and they, like, they're the winners in this, right? When I was talking about that, I was like, you know, I think Adam has mentioned this on the podcast before. <laughs> So, yeah, we're thinking along the same lines. I I think about how this symbiotic sort of thing is really throughout nature. Um, I mean, down to our very bodies, as many people probably know, you know, we have mitochondria in our cells, which were free living organisms, which were then engulfed at some point by bacteria. And now we have I mean, they have separate um, genetic material from the rest of the cell. So that's our cell is a symbiosis of two different organisms. And David right. Plomman has written a book called The Tangled Tree. Yeah. Um, very much w- which is about this and just how much of what uh, is called horizontal gene transfer um, has happened across uh, what used to be called the tree but is really now more of a of a shrub. Um, but and then the you know the plants are rapid hybridizers. Um, right. so that there's, there, things are so much more mixed up than, than we'd like to think. Um, right. we're, yeah. We're, aren't we made up of, you know, more organisms that don't, that don't share our, that are, you know, share our DNA than we are ourselves in a, in yes. a real way? Um, I think that, yeah, I've read that a lot too, that the bacteria <laughs> in our gut are like, and, and elsewhere are like more than our own cells. Yeah, that and the other fascinating thing, which I think is in Quammen's book is, um, you know, our very DNA is full of old viral DNA that inserted itself in some ancient, you know, past. Um, And actually, one of those pieces of DNA, as it happens, its job is to uh, dampen immune response. 
And it actually is connected with the fact that mammals have placentas. Oh, wow. So, so it's very we fundamental. use viral DNA to be able to reproduce the way that we do as mammals. Yes, right. <laughs> Amazing. So at every level, it's, yeah, it, it's very much um, one organism acting on another organism, but it's, you know, going in both direct, more than one direction. Right. I mean, I mean, it's obvious because we live in our skin, why we have this um, pre predisposition to human centrism. But Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this constant battle to remind ourselves that, you know, we are, we are not what it's all about. You know, we're, we're a part of it. I, I, yeah. And I, I love that that work brings that up. I mean, if you just look deeply enough into the, the grapes and, uh, you know, you start asking these questions, it's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, you're, um, you have some, I think you, you've said to me that you, you really don't know that much about Vitus vinifera, that most of your experience is actually with Correct. native, <laughs> yeah, even, I know wine, even in terms of listeners. wine. <laughs> right, right. I so, was always the person who's um I would ask my husband, you know, get me a glass of something that I'll like. That that was my knowledge of wine. Right, right, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. And and have you drunk a much wine? I imagine a lot of local wine for you. You could go either way, hybrids or Vitus vinifera. Is that well correct? it really so because of this and because of this journey, and I want to throw out by the way, this this journey was a nice long, it was what I did during COVID because the workshop was canceled twice. So I kind of started looking into this in 2018 and the workshop didn't happen until last fall. So I spent a long time really exploring these topics and, and, um, um, and really exploring um, what hybrids were available locally and um, learning from people. And I really have gotten excited about the hybrid grapes. Um, you know, I, I understand that, uh, well, actually I have to say it changed it in that time. It's interesting because I feel like the first time that, um, Bill Hatch of, uh, oh, it'll come to me, the name of his vineyard, um, explained to me uh, the whole thing about hybrids, um, which was fascinating to me. And they were making Chamboursin and some others, Chardonnay, um, and he said, yeah, we have to call it something else because, you know, nobody wants to buy the the customer just doesn't want these. And, you know, that changed by last fall when I was still asking the questions of people. And it was like people that was changing. Um, yeah. There was more in the winemakers themselves. And as it happens, I live in Virginia. Uh, the year before the workshop, I think, um, they did a survey of Virginia wine growers um, and there's a fairly big industry in, in Virginia and um, came back wine growers were like, they said, what do you want? They said, you know, we want things that could combat powdery mildew and um, adapt to climate. And they were looking basically for uh, using these hybrid hybrid breeding to produce these, these hybrid wines. And, um, out of that, as it happens, uh, they, um, some very enterprising people in the area uh, got some funding to hire a uh, start a brand new program at the local USDA station, which is in Kernysville, West Virginia. And um, the breeder has just started there. So it's a brand new position, brand new breeder. He actually came to our workshop, which is how I sort of learned all about this. And his, um, you know, his aim is to... Um, breed grapes that are suitable for the mid-Atlantic region. But sorry, I got off the topic of which is that I really um, have gotten excited about drinking the hybrid wines. And um, I think I'm moving over towards preferentially, you know, it's fun to buy local. And um, uh, we also, I also enjoy the ones from um, Stone, oh dear, Stonehill. Um, you know, so I do try to drink, I drink a lot of the Norton and the Chambourcin. I, I, I happen to like, uh, red wines. And, um, I remember in a previous podcast, you were talking about, it's funny how people think they're either white or red. So I think I'm one of those people who <laughs> has never explored enough to know the other, but, um, yeah, I have to say those, those are the ones I look for, uh, right now. Nice. Well, I, I mean, I, one of the things that I think about is, you know, in this, and, and I think this is a, a transition into 
asking you about some of the things that you care a lot about as you take a perspective on grapes and wine and these things. Um, you know, my thinking has evolved and changed quite a bit. And I try to be really humble because of that, because I know everybody comes at this from a different place and they're all, you know, we're all on, on a path and, <laughs> and everything <laughs> else. But I, part of the way that my mind has changed when I got excited about hybrids was initially, like I saw this potential to, you know, breed the new, whatever it was, whatever your favorite grape is, fill in the blank if it's a vinifera and, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon or whatever, Syrah. And to breed a new one uh, that actually never needed to be sprayed, you know, that just yes. was resistant to everything, you know, could adapt to, you know, was could deal with heat and cold and, and all this stuff. And then the where my thinking is now is that you know, so it's sort of like the quest for the Holy Grail, right? <laughs> um, in, in some ways, literally. <laughs> and so I, yeah. I, what, where my thinking is now, though, is like realizing it's, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, when you think that way, you start blaming vinifera. Like you start saying, you know, huh. vinifera is, is this problem because, you know, people, cl you know, have this, uh, cling to it. And now we need, what we need is something new that isn't a problem grape anymore, you know, that doesn't cause us to spray all this chemical crap all over it to make it survive if we weren't so attached to it and what i realize is it's it's more in the way that i think it's the, in my thinking of this need for another grape instead of thinking of agriculture of viticulture as more setting up a system and a process of ongoing adaptation and evolution with nature you know so you're mm -hmm. constantly mm -hmm. breeding constantly selecting you you constantly introduce diversity and and it's never, you never arrive somewhere, you know, yes, yeah. you will find certain varieties that work really well in your specific location at, for the time that you're alive and you'll propagate those and use those to make wine with, but you should never stop, you know, having a diversity of things because the years will change. Our climate is changing and mm -hmm. you should never stop, you know, breeding and selecting because, there isn't an end, you know, like the one constant yeah. is change, you know, evolution <laughs> hasn't stopped. Like we yeah, haven't just arrived true. at the pinnacle yeah. of, of evolution, you know, it is an ongoing process. Um, and I don't know if, you know, if you can relate to that in, in your own, you know, journey, but I know that you have some really interesting perspectives on, on just nature in general. And I, I would love to sort of get you, you know, draw you out if I inspired you with <laughs> to start talking about them in any way by what I just said, but or or did it start at any point in your journey where your your ideas got really interesting about this stuff? So um, yeah, I was actually brought up in a household that um, really talked about the environment and sustainability a lot, um, and um, you know that was in the sixties and seventies, so it was a while back. So um, I think it's interesting to see where people make that transition uh, into an environmental outlook because it happens at various times for various people. And like you're saying, I think it's important to have humility about, about that. And um, so I saw myself going through various stages throughout my life um, and becoming sort of, mm, I would sort of say less dogmatic and less angry and also <laughs> just this sort of like less in search of some sort of purity as if there had mm. been some sort of you know garden of eden that we're trying to get back to and um right and so i i do find myself trying to sort of help other people along that path now especially you know yeah when you first start to think about the environment if you haven't been thinking about it then all of a sudden it's pretty scary um, mm -hmm. uh, of, you know, this is our niche and we need to, um, yeah, if, if we're going to go on, we, we need to have it, uh, continue to function. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I've moved further and further from sort of a purity idea, um, to really thinking of ourselves as, you know, we're animals and we're part of nature. And I think it's, I'm not sure there's anybody, well, I don't know about this, but, I try to get away from pointing fingers at 
because in some way we're all part of the system, you know, um, we yeah. all benefit in one way or another from something some corporation is doing. I have aired too much on that side and have not been activist enough. And many of my friends are much more activist than I really appreciate that because I think political activism is very important. Um, I've spent a lot more time thinking about my impact actually to the point of being paralyzed by that. So I'm, I'm also working, I've also worked through that, but. um, I mean, what you were saying, especially about purity and stuff like that, like what makes me want to bring up this um, PowerPoint that you've done about the cosmic evolution story as a, Mm -hmm. and, and I think you did this as a presentation and, and you can talk about that. I'd love you to talk about that. But I, you know, as I started going through it, um, you know, there's that quote that I mentioned that there is no such thing as right. The very concept needs to be replaced with progressively less wrong. Yeah. <laughs> which I that, love. Isn't that, isn't that Paul, great? Yeah. Paul so Grobstein. That, Paul yeah. Grobstein. I, you know, I ran across that on the internet years ago and, um, we need to understand, and that that helps with the frustration people have with science. It's like, well, now they're telling us this, you know, and and do those scientists know what they're doing? And it's like, well, there is no, you know, they're they're not going to find the final answers. All that all all they can do is sort of say, well, we found out these things, you know, right. aren't accurate. But but there's there's no way we're really ever going to understand, you know, the universe and. Um, or anything else really in, in science, we can just be progressively less wrong. So I, I do think that's very powerful. I'm so glad you brought it up. So I wanted to ask you, you've mentioned something about strawberries and buying strawberries and how this, <laughs> how this affects you. <laughs> can you right. talk about that? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, you know, you know, you know, well, how sometimes you'll have like a whole bunch of swirling thoughts and then you'll like kind of narrow it down by putting in one little word like strawberry. I was just, what I was musing about, and I do think this might've been in response to also listening to your podcasts and, but it's what I think about a lot anyway, is that, um, well, I guess it all came about because I was thinking about like, as consumers, do we need to demand something different from monoculture? Is that even possible? I, I, I don't know the economics of it and feeding the world and all that stuff, but um, t- definitely my tendency does go towards the idea of, um, you know, the whole orchard garden type thing. And I, I was thinking about, I was thinking about um, our changes that we, behavioral changes and how it's hard to make behavioral changes and, you know, um, and how, however, sometimes we do get to a point where we're able to make that and it becomes a visceral thing. And I was thinking about stuff I read from Jonathan Haidt years ago about um, just how if you cognitively say, oh, I should do this because my values are such and such. But of course, you know, let's just say eating chocolate. You know, I probably shouldn't overindulge in lots of um, sweets, but my gut wants me to do that. You know, that that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Um, so my values are such that like, I was thinking about strawberries because my values are such that like, I really should not buy these daggone clamshells. I hate the clamshells. Yeah. They turn out they don't recycle after all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's all been a big, it's all been a big, you know, yeah. campaign by the plastics industry to make us think we could even recycle the clamshells. So there's right. that. And then these big, beautiful, huge, strawberries and um i was thinking about the cognitive dissonance that happens when i try to make choices in the grocery store and i think that's where i said it can make my head explode sort of but um <laughs> then i was also thinking about how no there's certain times and i think i've finally gotten there with the strawberries that come in the plastic clamshells where i'm like i do not need to buy this in february and um right I, it's not that I never do. And if they if, if I'm at someone else's house and they've bought them, <laughs> I'll probably eat them, you know, but it's, it's like, I have these values of what we should do. And then cognitive, that's a cognitive thing that you're saying, this is what we should do for the good of, you know, the planet or humanity or whatever. And then, 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 then there's all the gut feelings where it's just really hard to change something like our eating habits. And I guess I was thinking about that in terms of the sort of, beautiful, perfect looking things in the grocery store and how we all know, or all of us who even give it any thought 
know that like that's not a sustainable thing um, yeah. Yeah, to have these things there watermelons um, don't grow in america in january right <laughs> <For example>. yeah <laughs> and then like, there's you know but you know or then whatever then I've had people say to me, well, you know, international trade's important. And one time we were in Peru, like actually doing agriculturally based stuff. And they said, well, this is kind of good for the farmers to be able to export. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Exports can be good. I don't know. It, that's why it makes my head explode because there's a yeah. lot of different things to think the livelihoods of the Peruvian who's growing, you know. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Once we're, once we're all connected and dependent on each other, it becomes even more complicated. Right. It's uh yeah, I think about that too. I mean, I think Sandor Katz, I don't know if you know who he is, but um, oh, he, yeah, wrote, yeah. he wrote like the Bible on, you know, home fermentation, uh -huh. um, more lactobacillus fermentation, not, not Saccharomyces fermentation, but, okay. um, you know, his whole thing was like, eat as local as possible. He's a big local food proponent. He's like, you know, that should be the majority of your diet, but he's like, you know, have you have a special treat make it a special thing when you have that thing that comes not locally yeah. you know yeah. don't treat it as a daily thing but don't deny yourself kind of like but like you know honor it as a special thing um mm -hmm. but all of this i think is a fantastic transition because any of us like you said who have developed an ecological consciousness and maybe are doing what we're doing, whether it's directly related to environmental conservation or preservation of these, these crops come from this place of knowing that we are in, um, a pretty, in pretty desperate times, environmentally speaking. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you have done a really beautiful presentation that I think is one of the most valuable things that I've read in a long time about your cosmic evolution theory or a cosmic evolution story and how mm -hmm. to deal with eco anxiety and I, I think i'd love to jump into that and and i love that we just started talking about strawberries and it just kind of shows how anxiety can come <laughs> into our lives at all these points if you just stop to be thoughtful it can almost stop you in your tracks it can almost paralyze you from doing anything because yeah. There are so they, yeah. these yeah. the the thinking behind our choices and and I mean strawberries is directly relatable to wine I think in the same way that you know I basically have stopped buying wine that's not grown organically at minimum and I've basically I buy maybe you know a, a, as much wine as I drink in a year I want I'm, I I want to say like the amount that I buy that's from somewhere outside of America is less than 5% honestly, um, at this point, you know, for mm -hmm. the same reasons, because mm -hmm. I think about this, like this whole unsustainable yeah. global trade based on fossil fuels that is behind those imported right. things. And you, you made a comment. What was it you said that so much of our eco anxiety was actually, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you, but I'll, I hope this makes sense, but it's almost more of an ego anxiety because we're really sort of processing our own death through our environmental work so to speak is that yeah. is that a fair paraphrasing of your yeah i think i was posing it as a question or, or yeah, yeah yeah i'm not saying you're that, you're claiming that but I mean, yeah because of our mortality is the great conundrum for us as a species that is able to think about our mortality right and what is environmental destruction but kind of mortality um and you you have this uh I'd rather be a eukaryote. Yeah, <laughs> We're talking about the trade-off and evolution, and this is such a great thing. What, yeah. can I read, do you mind if I read this? I just, no, no, and I just want to say first, though, it's from Ursula Goodenough. Ursula and, Goodenough, The um, Sacred Depths of Nature. Yeah, The Sacred Depths of Nature. Again, she's a biologist, but she's got this, some religious overtones, but it all fits together, I think, beautifully. Yeah, which is, <laughs> strangely enough, probably Should my forte. Should we explain what a eukaryote is again? A eukaryote oh, we will. We will. But let, we'll well, no, go way. ahead. Say, what is a eukaryote? Well, it's just a multi-celled organism as opposed to, for example, a bacteria. It's an, or, it's an, it's an organism that has, um, you know. And, and reproduction. Uh, mitochondria in it and organelles in it. And, um, and reproduction between eukaryotes. I mean, yes. it, is, it, yes. is just, it is made distinct by the way it reproduction happens right so you Thank have you. yes right instead of fission fission with bacteria pretty much well there's other things that happen with bacteria but you know they can go on and on because they can split they just split right but when sex you... was 
invented sort of and not invented, evolved or whatever. <laughs> Right. That this is these are the this is the problem with the language, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so sex becomes part of who we are because we're eukaryotes, um, and yes. and and <laughs> that's why I love this. I'd rather be a eukaryote <laughs> because <laughs> one of and then this is the quote: one of the greatest, or well, sorry, one of the central ironies of human existence is that our sentient brains are uniquely capable of experiencing deep regret and sorrow and fear at the prospect of our own death. Yet it was the invention of death, the invention of the germ soma dichotomy that made possible the existence of our brains. Um, so it's, I, I just think there's yeah. so much great irony to be humbled yeah. by in that, um, yeah. and to, to uh -huh. deepen our experience of life and sex and death, um, right. <laughs> just in that understanding of, uh, of evolution, you know, like I think that's yeah. where this this cosmic evolutionary story really has a profound uh, ending, so to speak, or ongoing yeah. <laughs> element. And the trade off is it's just an important concept because I think we would like to have things be just so and sort of perfect, but the the very thing that makes want something good in this way makes it not so good in another way, and it's not like we can get rid of the one. And, and actually this is where, when I talked to my friend Kathy about this, she talks about the Jungian um, shadow, you know, the embracing of a, of the shadow side and, and that everybody has one and that there's no, like, there's no perfection. <laughs> That's right. it. There's no perfection. And once we realize that and stop striving for it, I think we are well, happier and better equipped to go forward and solve problems. Yeah. And then her, her this this other quote i think does it does a really beautiful job of expressing that death is the price paid to have trees and clams and grasshoppers and wine i'll add and death is the price <laughs> yeah. and death is the price paid to have human consciousness to be aware of all that shimmering awareness and all that love yeah it's so great yeah i love that i know that's really my kind of um encapsulates yeah what I would and, like to remember every yeah. day. <laughs> um, and at the end. Um, yeah, you like this quote at the very end, right? The yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, okay. I, I, well, I also like this 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 idea of like, you play with this throughout this presentation on being a part of nature and apart from nature. And okay, you know, apart yeah, from yeah. nature is, apart, being apart from nature has been this Western, um, you know, idea that we've lived with for a few centuries uh, mm -hmm. and please but when we see ourselves as apart from nature uh which we has been sort of traditional in western culture i regard what i want to change as other and this is a little bit like what we we're talking about the sort of blaming and like if i could mm. change this what they're doing over here when we see ourselves as a part of nature uh, it's a gentle action approach to influencing change. And the way we approach that is I recognize that I am part of the system and part of what needs to be changed. Yeah, that's a really good, good insight. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then this final perspective, which I love too, if you, that, that last, the, 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 the last sort of thing for anybody experiencing eco anxiety yeah yeah um yeah this is really this is really nice uh, this is from again joel primack and nancy abrams from a book called the view from the center of the universe uh, which has a lot of wisdom in it um so the seriousness of the overall world does not require endless seriousness on the personal level our job is to live with joy while doing everything we can to improve the odds for our planet joy can help by increasing motivation the Talmud intriguingly says that we will be held to account for all permitted pleasures we did not enjoy. <laughs> and we've talked about how wine is one of those pleasures. And um, yeah. that it really means a lot to me because I, many of us were brought up in a, that we should not indulge in too much pleasure, you know? Yeah. So yeah, this is very, there's a, I think this is, is very releasing in that way. You know, and I think it's funny, I'm going to relate this to something sort of strange, but I just saw an article actually put out um, through some wine, wine trades about something about 
anyway, like dry October, which I don't, I didn't even know dry oh. October was a thing. No. Um, but it, it's basically the anti-alcohol lobby um, <laughs> uh, is putting out a lot of articles about the health benefits of uh, like what happens to your body with every week that you aren't drinking. Right. And uh-huh. and look, I'm not trying to deny there aren't wonderful things that happen from not drinking. I'm not trying to deny that, you know, alcohol isn't a neurotoxin and hard on your body in a lot of ways. All these things are empirically true. Um, I just feel like we are in this cultural thing where it's either all or nothing. And it's yeah. again, like, like take a step back, like take a little, yeah. take a beat, like, right. If we weren't also crazy neurotic and, and had addictive personalities because of our culture to consume and consume and consume far beyond what we need, we probably wouldn't need an anti-alcohol lobby, you know, <laughs> but because yeah. we live in this culture that is so, consumer based we overconsume and we overconsume things that can you know that when we overconsume are harmful for us but um you know like you were saying nothing's perfect in this world <laughs> and mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. some things actually can bring you joy even though they might be a little harmful to you you know and i, I these are i don't know these are, this is, was an interesting thing that i thought recently about wow what a strange world we're living in <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah like, right. I mean, I guess uh, everybody who smokes went through that recently where, you know, one of their great pleasures just became this uh, social anathema, you know, where yeah. it's like now. And, you know, I mean, I think that was a reaction against a lot of uh, horrible practices and part of big, to- big tobacco and lies and, you know, false advertising and, you know, yeah. ma- making claims that were totally BS as well as just exploitation and corruption. But, um, you know, like, I mean, tobacco has been used ceremonially for centuries, you know, as one of the sacred plants, like it's not an evil in and of itself. Um, So, yeah, I guess it just hurts when those things, those uh, prohibitions come home against the thing that you love. (laughs) And you start (laughs) like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, Don't start talking about my wine. Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, Dan, thank you for talking. I did. You have any um, parting thoughts about any of this? Oh gosh, Um, no. I mean, I I always enjoy talking to you. There's just a million directions we could go with any conversation that we have. So agreed. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. I, I'm, this, this was, uh, I think, really valuable to put out there. So thanks. Great. Okay.